Over a year ago, I posted a video detailing a bunch of random pathologic things that I found interesting. I loved putting that video together, and a lot of you seemed to like it. Of course, I'm still playing pathologic, and with every playthrough, I find something new. I've compiled a new list of fun facts, easter eggs, and other stuff. So without further ado, here's a collection of random pathologic things that I find interesting. First of all, I want to start out by clearing something up. In my first video, I showed off this mini polyhedron that you can find in a treehouse at the nutshell. And I kind of made it sound like this was the only one. When actually, these mini polyhedrons can be found at a few places. You might have seen another one of these just outside of Notkin's warehouse hanging above the door. Another can be found inside Murky's train car, and at the very top of the polyhedron you can find a whole bunch of them hanging from a string. On the topic of the nutshell, did you know that the treehouse isn't always there? In fact, all of the decorations around the building aren't there for the full duration of the game. On days 1 and 2, the area will be pretty bare bones, but come day 3, the entire area gets a makeover. The treehouse will be built, toys litter the area, and a whole bunch of decorations show up. This was a shock to me since you play most of the game with all these decorations being here, and early on, you might not even notice that previously, these things weren't around. Of course, the presence of all the kids' decorations does make sense, as they show up the same day that Khan moves into the nutshell to protect the polyhedron from infection. And he is the leader of a large group of kids, so it only makes sense that they would gather around him. On day 2, sometime after the funeral, you'll be told that Grace is speaking with Isidore. When you ask Grace to talk with him, you can listen in on a conversation he's having with someone. The interesting thing here is what happens when the interaction ends and Artemy gains a glimpse into the voices of the dead that Grace hears. Listen to this. Obviously, these voices are speaking in reverse, and if we reverse the clip, we'll be able to understand what they're saying. There are multiple people speaking here at different volumes, so it's hard to make out what everyone says, but there is one person who speaks clearly. Take this kiss upon the brow, and in parting from you now, thus much let me avow. You are not wrong, Mr. D, that my days have been a dream. Yet, if hope has flown away in the night or in the day, in a vision or in none, is it therefore the less strong? For that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. I stand amid the roar of a surf tormented shore, and I hold within my hand grains of the golden sand. How few! And yet how they creep through my fingers to the deep, while I weep. While I weep. Oh God, can I not grasp them with a tighter clasp? Oh God, can I not save one from the pitiless wave? As this voice said at the beginning, he is reciting the poem A Dream Within a Dream by Edgar Allan Poe. The poem speaks of a person questioning life and reality, which is likely the same situation that these spirits are in. Have you ever wondered what would happen if you skipped collecting Artemis' inheritance? Well, I did. Normally, after Isidore's funeral, Aspidy will take you back to her hospice and you'll get the list, some money, and an inventory upgrade. If you don't do this, then on the next day, you can run into Aspidy around town. 
To my knowledge, there are only two other bound members who spawn around town like this. That being the Changeling and Murky, who you're pretty much guaranteed to run into. You've probably never seen Aspity doing this because you'd have to go out of your way to miss the funeral and refuse the inheritance. Here's another thing you've probably never seen before. I was curious as to what would happen if you upgraded your inventory without the upgrade from the inheritance, and well, here it is. Your inventory will just build around the missing space and leaves this gap. Another interesting result of skipping the inheritance is where the bound kids are added to if you don't have the list category. When you read the list, all the kids are added into the list section in the People tab, but what if you ran into them without it? Before the funeral, you can meet Grace, Capella, Sticky, Murky, and Notkin, and all of them are added into the Nerves section. Taya and Khan are the only two you don't meet before the funeral, so if we wait until the later days to meet them without ever getting the list, where do you think they'll end up? In the Bones section, or Nerves, or maybe even Blood? Well, if you chose any of those options, you are wrong. Despite having no knowledge whatsoever of a list, Khan and Taya will still be added to it and the list category will appear in your bound tab. The rest of the children will remain in the nerves section. Remember on day 3 when the bell starts ringing and you step outside to find all the town's people are nowhere to be seen? The town is littered with decorations of death and a bunch of silent, motionless tragedians point you towards Town Hall where when you arrive, you find the town's leaders discussing an outbreak, and you're hit with the severity of the situation. Well, it's completely possible to ruin the vibe of this moment. If you've somehow missed the messenger, then they can still spawn in during this. They'll say what they have to say, then they'll just stand around, like they're not ruining a moment. While I was messing around with the console commands, I stumbled upon a few cut items. These items can be added to your inventory and interacted with, but they don't spawn naturally. In my original video, I mentioned that the tree panner and forceps can appear as loading screens, but these four items can only be seen by manually adding them to your inventory. These are the plague finder, a half brain, a flask, and a blood filled flask. I believe that all of these items were present in the game's alpha, but were ultimately cut for a variety of reasons. The plague finder was probably scrapped due to the devs wanting it to be unique to the bachelor, while the others could have been scrapped due to there being better versions of these items. The half brain is obviously replaced by the regular brain. And from reading the flask quotes, it seems like originally the devs wanted it to be used specifically for collecting blood, which a regular bottle can do just fine. Before we move on to the next item, I just want to show off this image I found while researching the cut plague finder. According to the wiki, this is a promotional image showcasing what the viewed or the plague finder was going to look like. I'm not sure how I would have felt if this was actually implemented, but it sure does look interesting. Did you know quite a lot of characters share voice actors? It's a common practice in a variety of media for voice actors to voice multiple characters, but I was surprised to find that quite a few people voice two or three of the Bound members. Grief and Andre share a voice actor, and so do Ruben and Young Vlad, Gorman Oyen and Peter Stomaton, Anna Angel and Capella, Katerina and Lara, Aglaya and Maria, and Artemy and Victor. Grace, Yulia, and Eva also share a voice actor, and so does Daniil and both Alexander Bloch and Alexander Sabarov. All of these people did a phenomenal job, especially since I could never tell they were the same people. Also, if you wait until the end of the credits, you'll come across this familiar message. It took me a huge amount of time to notice that the game's clocks actually move. If you look closely at the save points around town, you can watch as both clock hands slowly move. You will even be able to hear the clock ticking. This isn't only limited to the save point clocks. The clock on the outside of the cathedral moves as well. Inside of Aspidy's hospice, you can find a ladder into her attic. You can't climb the ladder, and from down below, it looks like nothing interesting is up there. But, if we use console commands to take the camera up there to look around, we can find this easter egg. I'm pretty sure this is a collage of all the devs at Icepick Lodge. On day 10, after you sleep at any time, you'll find the exit to whatever building you're in is blocked by the plague. He'll tell you that he wants the kids on the list, and all of them will get infected. Seeing as this guy will always block your way out and you need to talk to him in order to get past, it seems that the kids getting infected is unavoidable. Well, what if you never slept for the duration of day 10? 
Unfortunately, the kids do still get infected, but in an interesting way. At 1900, no matter where you are, Artemy will pass out and wake up in Aspidy's hospice, where you'll be cornered by the plague and forced to speak with him, thus getting the kids infected. I don't think I would have ever discovered this if I didn't do a challenge run a while back where sleeping wasn't allowed. Did you know that the death toll on day one accurately represents the dead and missing people you can find on that day? After day one, you can see the death count reach higher and higher, but only on day one can you identify all seven dead people and the three missing people. I'm pretty sure the three people who went missing are the three men that jumped Artemy at the beginning. Every other dead person we can find today will have plenty of witnesses around, and the only person who sees what happened to these three men is an unreliable child who, depending on your actions, might end up traumatized before the end of the day. So I think I'm right about this. Next, let's count all seven dead people. You can find the first three dead people in the empty lot in the gut. Number four and five are both herb brides. One of them is burned at the bone steak lot, and the other is found dead in the tanners by the pharmacy. The sixth dead person is the woman who jumps off the termitary in the Skinners. And the last dead person is Isidore Barach, who dies a few hours before you arrive. Here's something I bet you've never tried. Shooting a member of the Bound. Obviously, this doesn't do anything, but attempting to do so will always cause your firearm to jam no matter its durability, which I think is interesting since the devs could have easily just let you waste a bullet. This auto jam also applies to shopkeepers. Have you ever heard of the pass? It's an item available on day two and it's incredibly easy to miss. This item is tied to gaining access to Isidore's house after it was locked following his death. Normally after the funeral, I go to town hall to get the house unlocked, but doing this will lock you out of seeing this item. Instead, you'll have to wait until much later in the day. If you head to Isidore's house for the first time on day 2 after 2200 but before midnight, you'll find that the surrounding buildings are already showing signs of infection, which is normally seen only after you've gained access to and exited the building. The front gate will be blocked off by guards, and due to the danger, they tell you a pass is required from Sabarov. At Town Hall, Sabarov will unlock the house for you and give you the pass, which can then be given back to the guards for entry. Since I always handled the funeral and unlocking Isidore's house early, I never knew this item existed. While we're on the topic of Isidore's house, did you know you can interact with the gramophone here? Doing so, we'll play this song. Something that surprised me is the fact that the executors are dressed differently depending on who's under the costume. As soon as you speak with an executor, you can usually tell who you're talking to, but their outfits can also reflect this. Plain brown executors will always be town orderlies, while executors decorated with bones are supernatural or meta characters like Beacon Talon and the Sand Pest Personified. On day 7, you can visit the cemetery and you'll find a mass grave just outside the wall. If you examine this grave, you'll find a lot of bare arms and infected bodies buried around, but in this pile, there are three people we can actually identify. In one of the corners, we can see a sleeved arm with a glove on their hand. This arm matches perfectly to the goose NPC. Toward the middle, you can find someone's back, and in another corner, another arm and glove. These two people are the same variant of the Oriole NPC. This last thing is just a small theory I have. Sleeping on day 8 will have you experience the theater dream, where you'll watch as all three healers have a debate on the theater stage. Off to the side of this, kind of backstage, is a table with three chairs around it. Well, I believe these three chairs each reflect one of the healers. It can be hard to see, but if you raise the brightness, you can see the details of each chair. One is a wooden chair held together by nails. Another is a fancy chair with the cushion sewn in, and the last is a metal chair with an intricate design on its back. I think the wooden one belongs to Artemy due to his roots with the kin and their ties to the earth, which results in his chair being rather simple and natural. The cushion chair belongs to the bachelor due to him being from the capital and having a wealthy background, which means his chair is the most comfortable. This leaves the metal chair with the design on it for the changeling. I don't have as much knowledge on Clara as I do on Daniel and Artemy, so I'm just gonna say she gets the intricately designed chair due to the complexities of her character. Let me know if this chair thing makes sense, or if I'm just looking for meaning where there is none. And there it is. That's every new interesting thing I've found since my last video.
If you know of any more obscure things from Pathologic 2, leave a comment, and maybe in another year I can make a part 3 to this video. I hope you enjoyed the video, thanks for watching, and goodbye.